Can you imagine life without being able to speak or even to swallow? Joining us today is Jennifer Kent Walsh, Assistant Professor of Communication Sciences and Disorders. Jennifer is here to tell us about tools being used to help folks get over disabilities and also clinics to help make sure they get the help they need. Thanks for joining us today. My pleasure. I guess to start out with, I would like to talk about who comes to you. What are the kind of things that have caused this loss of the ability to communicate? Sure. Well, we have a number of different categories of clients, really, who come to us. Some of them are individuals who have developmental disabilities. So they were born with some type of disability um, that makes it a little bit difficult for them to communicate, as you said, to swallow, um, to do move about in their environment, whatever it is that they might need to do because of their disability, they have some difficulty in doing that. So we help them to identify some technologies, sometimes that are very high tech and sophisticated and sometimes very simple um, that wouldn't even necessarily be thought of as technology that could help them to do what they need to do. Well, you know me, I want to get to the toys, but uh, first, uh, <laughs> FAST. Let's talk about FAST. Give us the, what the acronym stands for and give us an idea of uh, the scope of its services. Sure. FAST stands for the Florida Alliance for Assistive Services and Technologies, and it is um, an organization that is based in Tallahassee. We have a number of different satellite centers, if you will, or demonstration centers across the state that allow us to get a little bit more directly out to work with the clients across the state. So we have some programs that are run uh, out of Tallahassee, and we help our constituents in our 10 counties um, to access those programs, and then we have other programs that we run directly um, right in Orlando where our center is based. But you're all the way down toward West Palm Beach as well. Yes. You've got a big area to cover. We sure do. And, and we get requests from all over. Um, clearly the clients that are the closest to us in our, in our counties in Central Florida are able to come in and see us a little bit more readily. But even those clients in those outlying areas are also contacting us and certainly expressing needs for services. So we're looking for creative ways to reach out to them. There are so many different kinds of assisted technologies, but in, in your particular position and fast. We're talking about for people look, helping them to communicate. Right. I can't imagine how frustrating it must be for these people to, to do something so simple, so basic for necessary not only to enjoy life but it's also as a matter of safety. Exactly. There's so many things that come up when you think about communication. So it's not just, as you said, socializing with friends or um, talking about things that are of interest to you, but also communicating uh, basic messages relating to medical needs, uh, relating to safety needs, and all of the different things that we need to do, not just face-to-face -face communication, but as you know, we all use computers and so many different forms of technology in everyday life. And our clients who have disabilities also have the need to use those technologies as well. And I was surprised by the number. I mean, one in 14, I believe it is, right. Floridians have some type of need like this. Exactly. And an expression that's used a lot in our field is that technology makes things possible for people like you and I, makes things um, easier, I should say. I have to back up on that one. Mm -hmm. That technology makes things easier for people like you and I. So sometimes um, we can do things quickly, more quickly or easier if we go online and do something or if um, we use a GPS as I did today to get here to find your location. Um, but for people with disabilities, it makes things possible for them. So they may not be able to do some of the things like their banking or um, communication or whatever it is that they might need to do without some form of technology. I was reading a blog from one of the people who has one of these assistive technologies and I, in it she, she wrote, yes, I use many. I used one to wake up this morning. It's called an alarm clock. And then I used one to go on the computer. And like you say, we really do use them. But this is a, a matter of necessity for them. OK, here's, the, here's the, all right, the ridiculous question. You can laugh at me if you want. How do they contact you if they have trouble communicating? How do they, how do they get in touch with you? Well, we mentioned technology in general. Sometimes clients who have difficulty with face-to-face -face communication are able to use email, for example. So we do get um, requests that way. We just uh, get an email uh, that folks have heard about us and they're wondering about our services, or sometimes they have a real specific need that they want to come to us for. In other cases, then we have family members, we have other professionals contacting on their behalf. So we'll get a referral from an occupational therapist in the area or a teacher in the area who calls and says, I have this client or I have this student and we're not able to do um, A, B, and C with them. Could you try to help us? 
In the old days, uh, uh, they had TDD, I believe it was called, uh, which was a landline-based system. This is a world of cell phones. Do they still have a system of, like that in effect uh, for folks that, that need this communication link? Absolutely. So we have um, a lot of different options for individuals who need to communicate. As, as we said, it's not just face-to-face. -face, it's all those other things that we need to do on a daily basis. So absolutely. And when I was reading about it, you said that they, they could be very technical, very advanced, and sometimes very simple. It said as simple as even putting a larger sticker on a computer keyboard for someone to see makes a huge difference in their lives and what they're able to do. Exactly. What's the simplest thing you've ever worked with? Um, probably a pencil grip on a pencil. So you and I can pick up a pen or a pencil and, and hold it without a problem. It doesn't really matter how thick or thin or short or uh, long it is, but someone else with a specific uh, fine motor impairment may not be able to write, sign a check, write whatever they might need to write, um, but you give them a specific grip that's um, made for a pencil that allows them to hold it, then they can all of a sudden do some of those things that they need to do. So pretty basic. That's we've, wonderful. We've teased uh, folks a little bit about uh, some of the toys that you brought, uh, things that, that are very important in the lives of many people. Uh, we're going to take a short break and uh, come back and talk with uh, Jennifer a little bit more about assistive technology. You stay with us. And we're back with Jennifer Kent Walsh, an assistant professor of communication sciences and disorders. We're talking about assistive technology. And right before the break, I referred to, to them as toys. And, and I didn't mean that to be demeaning in any way, but, but when my daughters were little and Charna's children as well, there were devices at, that were toys that would talk. You would push a button and it would say something. You would, uh, uh, you know, uh, pass a card or a wand over it or something and it would it would do something that was interactive and really is kind of the foundation I guess for for some of the assistive technologies that you brought with us sure well we actually try to learn some things from the toy manufacturers when we're talking about young children who have disabilities and who have these types of needs so we want things that are of interest to them um, so we really want things to be um, exciting and to have to draw their interest so that they are actually willing to use it when it comes time to communicate communicate for example. So uh, in some ways they are toys, of course they're even for adults, we have our own toys, right? So we like to use our, our Palm Pilots or um, our other technologies that we really do see as fun to use and we are trying to um, target that with our clients to make sure that they realize that these are just tools for you to be able to do whatever it is that you want to do if you're um, a child with your friends at school or if you're an adult in your workplace with your friends, etc. And it removes any perception of stigma as well. Exactly. Can you show us the one you brought with you? Sure. Well, I have a number of, of things here today, but the one um, that I'm going to give you a little bit of a demonstration on has a couple of different options. This um, text scan, as it's called, it allows the client to be able to touch the message that they'd like to say. You can see here that there are a number of pictures on the display, and um, this particular client would be a child who is not able to read, so they wouldn't be able to store their messages based based on um, writing or traditional orthography. So they would look at the pictures, and when they wanted to say that they were mad, they would press the button mad. Um, and Probably they, more than once. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, however, some of our clients are not able to just use their finger to touch the button, so they may not have the fine motor skills to be able to do that. So what I have here um, is a switch that a person could have attached to their wheelchair, for example, or they could have accessible to their hand or leg or even their head so that they can drive um, the communication device from um, the perspective that they're in where they're able to use use that 